Ladies and gentlemen, thank you. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to share with you uh, our experience uh, in working with uh, friends in Hong Kong and in China. My name is Stephen Lee. I'm currently the director of the uh, Entrepreneurship Center. Uh, before I begin, I need to give some proviso. First, the info that we are presenting is just what we saw and experienced. It is not at all <laughs> intended to be comprehensive or exhaustive. China is a very, very large market. Uh, so <coughs> it is beyond our scope to even pretend to give a comprehensive read. So basically, the points that we will discuss here is uh, hopefully intended to begin discussions. Uh, the discussion points basically will consist of first some discussion on the general environment of, of uh, entrepreneurship in Hong Kong. Uh, and then uh, who is doing what generally? And if we want to get greedy and say, okay, how, how can we make it better? Then some discussion on some area of improvement that could help in Hong Kong. Uh, then we will shift the second part to a discussion on the uh, generally entrepreneurship in Hong Kong, in China, uh, particularly focused on the Pearl River Delta. Uh, finally, we'll talk about what HKUST Entrepreneurship Center is doing in Hong Kong and China uh, in these contexts. So general environment in Hong Kong, uh, and I'll here particularly talk about students because we are part of the university. The students' primary concern still is on the employment market. Uh, housing market has become what we are seeing to be perceived as an opportunity cost. Uh, frankly speaking, the housing market price has, has gone up very, very rapidly in the last four years, some will even say 10 years, and it has outpaced wages significantly. Um, in the two years I've come back to UST, we have probably spoken with thousands of students, uh, many of them PG students. And while seeking entrepreneurship is there's an opportunity cost, in the context of Hong Kong, the opportunity cost takes on a very different dimension. Uh, those who seek employment are already looking at trying to chase a moving train. If we think about the real estate market as a, as a train that you won't get onto, the train is moving faster and faster, and even based on basic wages, some uh, have, already, have already some reservation on whether or not they can ever uh, get onto the train. And in that context, entrepreneurship <coughs> will probably uh, put them at a further disadvantage in terms of chasing the train. So the, the, the opportunity cost uh, uh, in Hong Kong takes on a different dimension. The interest, therefore, uh, what we are seeing is that the interest for entrepreneurship has increased in Hong Kong, particularly because of all the investment that uh, going around, all the money that's being released by, by different parties in China and in Hong Kong. But it has not yet reached what we would call the critical threshold. And I'll explain it simply in terms of the first adopter group. You know, when we look at a marketing segment, we, we always look at the top 10%. The top 10% are always people who will do this regardless. The second group are people who will want to see more favorable conditions. What we are seeing in Hong Kong is that the entrepreneurs have not yet reached the second group. It's, it's still very limited to those who are, who are passionate about entrepreneurship, period. So it has not reached the critical <coughs> threshold. And so what we are seeing is that uh, there's a lacking a concerted, what we would call pre-entrepreneurship effort. This probably in Hong Kong particularly have, uh, have meaning. And the way I would, I would present it, or put it into perspective is this way. If we look at the pop Hong Kong population of, of consisting of say seven million people, and we say that those who are of the age to, to pursue entrepreneurship, say it's about 25%. Then we're looking at uh, 1.7 1 million. Those with interest, if we are looking at not able to, to pass the critical threshold, then would be the first adopter group. 10% of that would have interest. That brings it down to 170,000. So if a, put, if a typical, typical startup team requires a core, core team member of five, then we are down to 30,000 teams. And if we further says that those with interest actually has an idea, uh, then that brings it down another 10% or 90%. So 10% of that is 17,000. So very quickly, the numbers start to collapse very quickly. Uh, we are now looking at 3,000 teams with ideas, and this is not even discussing good ideas or compelling ideas. So the pool is pretty weak, and 
in my opinion, is because there is a lack of uh, uh, common consensus on what pre-entrepreneurship is and the need for pre-entrepreneurship training. So what we are seeing, I think not only in uh, HKUST, but also my colleagues in different universities, what we are seeing is a steady declining of pool of entrepreneurs. Uh, as, the, as the government and different sectors start to pump in more money, the first batch of really talented or those promising entrepreneurs uh, move on, and then there, there's a segregation between uh, the pools of entrepreneur and the pool of pre-entrepreneurs, uh, lack of adequate training for pre-entrepreneurship uh, because of the opportunity cost, the threshold is not being, being crossed, and so the pool, what we're seeing is that the pool is um, steadily declining. So, about those 10%, uh, where do these figures come from? I, I, this is just our, our estimation. This, this is not, this, this does not at all pass the record of academic quality. This is why I said this is just our experience and our view. Okay, okay it's just intended for, for discussion. I'm not, I'm not pretending that this is going to be pub published at all. Okay. This is simply say, what we are saying is that if we look at a market, and if, uh, if say, I want to sell a product, the, the market entry that I get into is basically the top 10%. This is the, what we would call the first adopter set. Uh, if, I, if I'm successful in the first adopter set, then I'll move on to the second group, which is probably the next 25% of the market. So what we, are saying, what we are seeing, or what we think is happening, is that because of the huge opportunity cost, we're not crossing the threshold from the first adopter to the second adopter. Because we're in the first adopter, it's generally about 10%, 10%, 15% of that order. So if we start to look at the number, it's very quickly, the number comes down to the point, you will see that there isn't really a large pool of teams to begin with. And so as you draw them, then the numbers start to whittle down. And if we don't put in concerted effort to create pre-entrepreneurs, then there's going to be a lack of materials. <laughs> it's sort of like building cars and you don't have an a, 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 a iron mine to extract the, the mineral from the ground. So who's doing what? Well, the government, I would say government-related entity, because Hong Kong, there are, of course, the Science Park and, and, the, and the Cyberport. Are they government? Are they not? I would just say related entities. Um, there are plenty of resources for qualified projects. Uh, I know that entrepreneurs, usually when you talk to entrepreneurs, you ask them what, they want, what, what they're missing, they'll say they're missing money. Um, I, I, in my opinion, I think there are plenty of, of uh, resources available for qualified projects whether it is funding, whether it is space. Uh, there are a lot of uh, organizations in Hong Kong that will offer you f uh, offer a qualified project, free space. Uh, hundreds of thousands of dollars, if not millions of dollars, to get started. So I don't think that resource is, ever, is, is, is the problem at this point. Uh, there are also plenty of resources for universities in general. Uh, there are all sorts of funds that's provided to university to stimulate entrepreneurship. There's something called a KT fund, which is called a knowledge transfer fund. This is given by the University Grant Council. There's, of course, IT, ITF by the Innovative uh, Technology Commission that, uh, uh, that will give money to professors to do more commercialized uh, research. And then there's the, the newest, what we call the tissue fund. Um, and this is fund that's given to university to foster technology transfer in terms of an actual R&D project. All of these funds add up to millions of dollars that are potentially available to a potential team. So I would say funding really is not the issue here. Uh, for the private and particularly for-profit entities, what we are seeing is that there are a lot of training camps, but for entrepreneurs. In other words, there's screening criteria. And the screening criteria is that based on the quality of your proposed idea, they will then screen the top 10 or top 20, whatnot, and then they provide training camp for these entrepreneurs. And here I want to distinguish the difference in terms of, in our mind, an entrepreneur and a pre-entrepreneur. An entrepreneur is somebody with a pretty good idea what they want to do. A pre-entrepreneur is just someone who wants to do their own, own business, but don't yet know what they want to do. Believe it or not, that group actually exists. We talk to students and the students say, I want to do my own business. And I say, what do you want to do? They don't know yet. <laughs> Those are what I call pre-entrepreneurs. Those pre-entrepreneurs would hardly be able to get into these, into these entities because these are for-profit entities. Um, so what they're looking at, potential investees. 
whether it is investing, investment of money, re investment of space, investment of time, investment of, of advices, that is inv an investment and they're looking for some kind of return. Um, there are a large number, they also provide a large number of social events and seminars. Uh, and what we are seeing in these social events and seminars is that many of them have now turned into brand name events. Some, maybe Jack Ma will come by and give a talk. Uh, some big name from, from US may come and give a talk. Uh, maybe a big name corporation like Google will sponsor a talk. These are what we would call brand, brand name events. Uh, the, from, our, from our perspective, these events really create more general awareness than anything else. Awareness of, by the entrepreneur of this particular entity. Borrowing or leveraging on the brand name to create or strengthen the image of this entity's ability to help entrepreneurs. Uh, the, in terms of walkaway value, I would say the walkaway value, in, besides increasing your will or hope to do entrepreneurship, the walkaway value is probably not really focused for pre entrepreneurs. Really focused for entrepreneurs. If you, got, if you have a good idea, come and work for me or come and work with me, I'll help you. But before that, probably not yet. So the universities, what are the universities doing? The universities provide academic courses and programs. Here at HKUST, we provide uh, be beyond the entrepreneurship center, which, is, which does not give academic courses. Faculties in, in the various departments offer entrepreneurship courses. We also have a master's program on, on uh, uh, entrepreneurship, basically. Uh, we also have a minor program. So universities provide academic courses and programs. Uh, there's an incubator, most of the universities have some kind of incubation programs. Uh, we definitely have an incubation program. Uh, then, of course, there are the seminars and workshops, which is what we at Entrepreneurship uh, Workshop, uh, Center focus on. Um, and then we run competitions. Various universities, we run some kind of competition, usually localized within the university. So if we want to talk about improvements in the Hong Kong uh, 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 arena, if somebody comes, if one of the government official come and ask, and in fact they have asked, <laughs> and the first thing we tell them is uh, macro condition is the priority. You don't fix macro condition, uh, whether it is policy, whether it is housing, that, that baggage just gets heavier and heavier. Students just don't think that they even have, to have, the, have the flexibility to take that gamble. The gamble if they, if they miss it, they forever, the, 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 the impression is that if they miss, the, miss that train, they will forever be, be homeless. <laughs> so that problem needs to be fixed. In the last discussion, I think there was a round of discussion that the government had with um, uh, some of us from the, from the uh, Entrepreneurship Center, whether it's UST or whatnot. And what we said to them is that they need to find a, um, a head uh, to help drive these policies in a proactive manner. And, the, our second sentence is that you won't happen <laughs> because of the uniqueness of the Hong Kong political system. And so I think we were very gratified to see that there is a movement to, to appoint this, uh, to, to formulate this new division or office and to find this head, but it doesn't look like it's going to happen anytime soon. So that's why we put this on red. Definitely this is not some, anything that we at USD can do anything about, but we do need to be cognizant of this, of this issue. We can improve coordination within the community for entrepreneurship activities. That's what we are doing. Uh, all the other universities, they're all different, doing different kind of activity to promote entrepreneurship, but there's very little coordination. Uh, and then there's even fewer coordination between universities and the other units, uh, for-profit units. So there, there, there can be improved coordination. And there, need, uh, there needs to be a building consensus on the importance uh, relevance and the content of pre-entrepreneurship training. Hong Kong is a very small island or peninsula, seven million people, there aren't enough people to go around. If we don't start cu cultivating that, we are going to run out very quickly. So it doesn't matter how much money you pump into the system, it's just not going to happen. Uh, so what we, pr through the pre-entrepreneurship training, the idea from our perspective is that we want to tap, tap the larger pool. We want to tap this pool. Not, not just this pool. In other words, even with, with the constraint of this macro condition, 10% of 7 million, 10% uh, uh, of 10%, very quickly we can get 30,000 teams. 
So we don't necessarily have to work with this group with the ideas. So long as they are uh, uh, pre-entrepreneur with interest, we can cultivate them. We can cultivate them so that their mind become more attuned to what are opportunities. What's the meaning of opportunity? How do they distinguish meaningful opportunity from opportunity equivalent to selling banana on the street? Okay, if they are prepared that way, and w through increased uh, interaction with the market, likelihood that they will pick up a, an idea increases. And so, if we work with this number, we can see, we can probably improve on this number, and create a, a steady stream of pre-entrepreneurs. So the crucial areas that we want to focus on for the pre-entrepreneurship will be, for example, teaming. Um, how do you form, formulate a team? Teaming takes on a different context when you are a company that doesn't even yet have an idea. Um, opportunity awareness. Uh, how do you define opportunity? How do you even uh, evaluate whether the opportunity is something that's worthwhile? Is the opportunity within your core competence? How do you define your core competence? What are areas that are worthwhile for you to pursue? Those are training that we think could help pre-entrepreneurs. And if that is successful, then we can at least have a support for the entrepreneurship uh, endeavors that's occurring here in Hong Kong in, in, and in the Greater China region. So I'll talk a little bit about the China environment. China is so large that any effort to talk about it is, is almost a joke. So we'll, we'll just focus on what we do know about. Um, Interest among the student population has passed the critical threshold, almost no doubt. Um, whenever, we, whenever we set foot in, in, in China, I'll, I'll, do the, I'll, I'll put it this way. If the same workshop or the same, same seminar that I offer in HKUST, I may have 50 if I'm lucky. The same workshop that I offer in China, I will have 350 sign up. And I will have a hard time limiting that number. The numbers are just huge, it's staggering. Uh, so I will say that, and this is not just because of the basic population, it's because as we, uh, what we are seeing is that as we walk through the campus, we are detecting that those that don't have typical alpha behavior, typical behavior that, that, would, that would signify them to be the early adopter, they are interested in entrepreneurship. That in our mind means that, we, that for that population is past the critical threshold. There's obviously in China, we're talking about China, so there's abundance of resource uh, money. <laughs> um, there are many, many, many high-tech innovation funds at various levels. And we are talking about at the central level, at the provincial level, at the city level, at the municipal level, they all overlap. In fact, if you ask me, I will say, I will say that there's too much money, if, there, if that would ever exist. But there's a lot of resources available. There are multiple competition at levels ranging from country all the way down to municipal, province, city, municipal, and university. They're all running a competition. They're all running entrepreneurship competition. And they're all running independently. With the, with the exception that the country level is being coordinated, uh, being implemented through the province, the city, and the municipal. So going down, there's coordination. Going up, there isn't. So university, they run their own. The municipal, besides running the country competition, they run their own. And then the city, they run their own. <laughs> and the province, they run their own. So just in the PRD uh, uh, area, at any given time in a year, 30, <laughs> 40 competition, easily. Um, and the competitions typically will always have some kind of angel or venture capital uh, investor in the mix, either in the judging panel or alongside the judging panel. And basically, the, this competi these competitions serve as a, a, a weeding mechanism for the angels and VCs to sprinkle money. The, the market is just too large. They cannot talk to everybody. There are just too many people. So they re rely on the competition to just weed out and look for promising projects. And then, so they, please. Have any angels in Hong Kong? Um, Angel investors, I, I, would, I would answer this question is yes and no. There aren't angel investors that are only Hong Kong based anymore. Any investors that are in Hong Kong would also be operating out of China. I have a question. Please. So what I see, I have a pretty good <coughs> ecosystem for developing entrepreneurs and a lot of resources. And the question is, 
how long did it take to, to build such a system to support entrepreneurs and who were the system that we are that we are seeing yeah like a, a lot of funds a lot of uh, vcs angels like, i mean a lot of supports i can get a lot of support and uh, so who, who was leading it was it was business it was government it was like the process of building this ecosystem you, you, you have asked many questions. Let me see if I can remember them. Uh, I can only talk about my impression. I do not pretend to know this at all, okay? But you, since you asked, I'll, I'll share with you what I think. I returned to HKUC in 2012. Uh, in 2012, this did not yet pick up steam. The, 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 the sprinkling of money in, in, in China did not yet pick up steam. I, I would say that probably with, with Xi Jinping, is when the, 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 the movement actually started. Okay. So he, he's been in office for what, maybe two years, maybe, maybe two years, maybe four years, roughly around that time frame. And so the, the money just went out. And at, at every single level, they are now, it's now been identified as a top national priority. Okay. It's all very recent. I mean, China has reformed for even a shorter time than Russia. I mean, <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's why I'm asking. Yeah. So, I mean, yeah. Yeah, time frame is, is very short. And there, there are pros and cons, obviously. When the time frame is short, then you, you run the risk of creating the equivalent of, of inflation. You're, you're pushing money in into, into a system that's not yet able to fully utilize the money properly. And so you create the, the equivalent of inflation. Yes, please. You said that there are a lot of students here who want to do something, but they don't know what yet. Yeah. This is sort of what I started off my discussion on. Yeah, so the, the macro condition, in my, in my humble opinion, the macro condition is a big rock. I've talked to many, I, I, I'll just talk about one team that I spoke, spoke to, it's PG student, PhD. Uh, the, the, the supervisor worked on this technology for 30 years, literally 30 years. The, the supervisor is now 65 years old. He came when he was 35 years old. So they've been developing this for 30 years. It's, it's a great technology. Um, it has market. I've spoke, spoken to the team. I tried to convince the, 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 the lead PG student, who, in my opinion, has the, has the making of a CEO. And I tried to convince him, do this. I, I'll help you find, raise some money. And, and his, his, his reply back is, I want to buy a house. Uh, I'll get married. My wife will have kids. And I will live off the rent from the apartment. And this is his reply. These, this is, the, what, we, what, we, what you're talking about is the difference between whether you're just looking at the group of students that are just driven to start their own business, this is what I would call the early adopters, versus those that, are, that would have interest but are not that gamble-oriented. That would, I would call that the second group. In Hong Kong, we have not yet been able to pull the second group. Uh, I, that, that, that's a question that's, that's way beyond my, my reach. I, I, I run the Entrepreneurship Center. My job is to, is to help cultivate the, 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 the spirit. But since you asked the question, I'll give you my personal, view, my, my personal view. Our objective is to educate students. The, the market comes with, with whatever pre, pre, preconceptual notion that, that it has. We, we, we hope to educate them. We hope to make them pre better prepared. If they come with, with the desire to get a better job, then our, jo our, our job is to help them succeed in that area. Uh, so that, that's, the, that's the larger context. Um, with, with, with regard to entrepreneurship, I think the, the issue really comes down to, first, that rock needs to be resolved. And that rock will eventually be resolved. Otherwise, there's going to be a larger and larger problem. Meanwhile, under that context, universities can do what they can. And I'll share with you what we are doing. We are, we are trying to make the best of the situation. 
Okay. And I, just a comment here. I, I think uh, your observation doesn't necessarily is not necessarily related to the admissions process. Yeah. Because uh, I think we're getting the best students in Hong Kong. Yeah. So it may be related much more at the societal level about no, uh, the kinds of values that people bring. When I, and the one thing that w is different here in the admissions process in the U.S. is that we admit you you commit to a major before you come here. Whereas in the U.S. system. Students usually explore around in their first or second year, and then they figure out what they're really passionate about, and yeah. so they choose their major after they come. Yeah. But the Hong Kong model is, follows the British model, and in, in, the, in Britain it's the same way. You apply to a specific major, and that's one thing that maybe would help students match more closely with their passions or interests. Well, what, I, what I was trying to say is that you said you're choosing the best students, but then it's a really, really subjective. It is, but it's, it's not very different than in the U.S. or the U.K. in terms of how they pick students, to be honest. I, I think. I mean, they're all after excellence. And, <laughs> uh, I, I don't think you would get. I don't think you could have a change in policy that would get a lot of different types of students into that. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned previously that uh, as soon as there is uh, too much offering for venture uh, funds and angels. Uh, they are driven by competition and they have an opportunity to choose from. Do I understand correctly that the, they prefer to fund on later rounds, not at seed or precede stage? No, they actually, they actually will, 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 will provide, what we are observing is that they will, they will generally provide funding at the, at the angel stage, mm. a very, very early stage. <coughs> even, they will even fund a project that, that is at the conceptual level. Yeah, they they actually in my in my in my observation, relatively speaking, they have more difficulty at the later round than than the earlier round. More of the money is going to earlier round than the later round, simply because the way the system is now operating, less of the company is successfully going through the stages. And so there's there's sort of like a backlog in to to to, uh, to clear this company. Mm -hmm. And so less of the money is going to the later round. More of the money is going to the earlier round. That's what we're seeing. How can you compare uh, startups at early stages? Uh, the, uh, it, I mean, the, the obviously, is, 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 is very subjective. So we draw some artificial line. Uh, there's usually, for example, a proof of concept stage. There's usually a prototype stage. There's a sales stage and a profit stage. If we break up into four, into those four stages, Okay, then the later round are at least the sales stage and the profit stage. The earlier round is, have you, have you even have a proof of concept? And the proof of concept does not even need to be a hardware. It can be proof of concept of a website. Suppose you want to run a Facebook website. Your basic underlying premise is that uh, there will be users because they want to post their photos. Is that premise valid? Have you tested that, that premise? So that's a, that's a, that would be the equivalent of PLC. Have you done a PLC? Are you now seeking to do a PLC? So that would be almost, from our perspective, a, a stage one company. And stage one company are getting funding, funding more. And then uh, stage two company are getting more funding. It is crossing the barrier into sales that what we are seeing, at least among our partners, they're having difficulty. Thank you. Okay. Is, is there a rule of thumb of, about how many entrepreneurs with, good, with some ideas actually are successful? Establishing a business. Uh, yeah, it's, it's usually single digit. Uh, single digit percentage. You mean, or single single digit percentage. Uh, entrepreneurs who actually get started, who are actually successful. If we define success as some kind of a meaningful exit, it doesn't have to be an IPO. It can be an M&A. If we define it that way, then the, the success rate is usually single digit. But here's the funny thing. Even though the success rate is single digit, there's also something called the, the three is the magic number. And, and, and the, the, the saying goes, and of course this or, or, or just ad hoc, the saying goes that if you, if you fail the first time and, and you do a second time, by the time you get to your third time, your success rate hits double digit. This implies that there is such thing as pre-entrepreneurship training. If, if, if success in, in entrepreneurship is just a purely a matter of your vision and your character and pre-born ability, then where do you get the entire data of three is a magic number? Three is a magic number implies that as you go through this process repeatedly, that there's a pattern behind it, that you, that you recognize the pattern, you figure out the, the, the name of the game, and you play the game better and better. 
So there is training. There can be training. It's just that it's not yet getting to the point where people talk about it, and so it has not yet gotten traction. Started speaking about venture capitalists. Can you name just maybe the the top player on the market? What what does it look like? What does the portfolio look like? The amount of money they attract. Them? I mean, just to fill the. I would say that nearly eighty percent of uh, companies that provide VC fund, uh, their money. Directly and directly comes from the government. Oh, really? Directly and directly, there are the the number of firms, VC funds that are actually spending their own money, relatively speaking, is fewer. Relatively, they exist, but relatively fewer. And there's segregation in terms of market. Whether you're looking at the Beijing market, whether you're looking at the Shanghai market, or whether you're looking at the Guangdong market. The funny thing about China is that it's so huge that each province. You, we can almost think of it as a, as a country, as a European country. That's how large it, some of the province gets. Uh, the Guangdong province has a population, if I remember correctly, something to the tune of 80 million people. That's almost the size of a, of a European country. So each of the provinces has its own dynamic. So that question depends really which province you're talking about. But I would say in general, uh, the bulk of the venture capital money that's going, going in is directly and directly come from the government. Is there any opportunity for a foreign venture capitalist that doesn't want to bother with selection of startups, just wants to invest into some venture fund? Of course. That, that opportunity al al always exists. And what we are seeing is that some of the U.S. firms, uh, some of the big name like Kleiner Perkins, they, they have already done that. And they're already in the market. But those numbers are very few. You can count the number of VC firms in the U.S. on two hands. In a, in a market like China, that, that, that will disappear very quickly. Even 10 VCs in China will have very little meaning. Why is it so? Why is what so? The, this this uh, huge amount of opportunity, the, uh, well, the formed market of uh, entrepreneurship and that small amount of venture, true venture. The pipeline is not clear. The pipeline from the stage one, stage two, stage three onward, that pipeline is not clear. It, in other words, it's, it's still got a choke, a choke point. The, the companies are coming in early stage, they're getting money, first stage. Second stage, they're getting money. But the final litmus test is, have they begun sales? And that is not something that the government can give you money to make happen. Do you have a customer? Is the customer buying from you? Are you able to make profitability? So that condition is now still not yet totally resolved. And until that, that condition is totally resolved, uh, appetite for, for investment is not going to be totally unleashed. Right? So suppose I invest in you. I need to find you a customer. Where, where would I find you a customer? If I'm from the U.S., then my network is in the U.S. Then I will find you a customer in the U.S., but that, that distance will be too long. You will be spending a lot of money trying to make that sales. Well, that's not the problem of uh, an investor. It's the issue for, for the company itself. It's an issue of the company. It's also an issue of the environment. Yeah. Because, because the, the, the more mature company needs to be in the market for innovation. Mm -hmm. If they're not in the market for innovation, then VCs will have more difficulty helping the innovative company f to find the next customer. But the more mature company, they need to even have the, have the bandwidth or the margin to even look for innovation. In Guangdong province, I've, I've talked to many SMEs, small medium enterprises. They have annual revenue of a billion RMB, a billion RMB, but their net profit margin is in a single digit. Mm -hmm. So they don't have the bandwidth, they don't even have the, have, the, have the mood to think about innovation because innovation is very risky. So that, the, the overall market condition needs to be resolved. So this is what I mean by saying well, too much money is going in. The, 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 the path is not clear, and you're pushing money in, and you can create a lot of other problems. <laughs> okay, so uh, practically the entrepreneurship is not of innovative type. It is it, they are. Traditional. They are. But the number that's successfully going through the pipeline is, is small relative to the number that's going in. Remember, the, we, in China, we talk about scale. In a particular province, I'll just talk, give you an example, Guangdong province. 
in, in, the, in the Guangdong province, the city of Foshan, in the city of Foshan, the municipal of Nanhai. This is municipal of a city of, of a province. Just in Nanhai, they got 30,000 startup team. 30,000 startup team, just in that, prov in, in that municipal. And each year, they got 10,000 coming in. So the number that's coming in far exceed the ability to exit. And so because that's the problem, external investors would have, I would think, less of a temptation going in because the, the path is still jammed. It's not cleared. OK? Yeah? What makes Hong Kong so successful like, if it still lacks, if it still have, has some things, some things to work on in terms of, like you said, policies. You mentioned policies, like housing. There are still some issues that need to be worked on, right? Yeah. And then what makes Hong Kong so successful from a business point of view? Uh, if you look at the Hong Kong economy, um, I, I think I, I would defer probably this question to, to my more esteemed colleagues who will probably, who can usually, usually publish 10 books on this. My, my forte is in entrepreneurship. Uh, I'm not sure that I would say that Hong Kong currently is a successful demonstration of entrepreneurship. At some point, Hong Kong was, certainly in the, in the 1950s and 1960s and 70s, it was a very successful entrepreneurship. I don't think at this point now we can say that. Um, that does not mean that it is a failure, but I think that Hong Kong's economy is now driven more primarily on the other pillar of the, of the market, particularly the real estate and the banking. I would say those are probably the pillar of the economy now and not necessarily innovation, not yet at least. Okay. So there are many incubation centers in China, many, 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 just in Nanhai alone. Uh, <laughs> there are like 20 in incubation centers. They're everywhere. Uh, so they usually, they usually will take your equity and they will give you space, they'll give you service. They will get, then get what they call entrepreneur mentor. They try to rope me in. I, say, I politely said no. And, and so the entrepreneur mentor will come in and provide service and then they get a cut of the action. So they get, uh, get a share of the equity. Uh, these incubation centers, they usually exit at the next investment. So they, they don't carry the burden of the, of the stock to the next round. So they come in, there's a VC, thank you very much, here's my cash, move on. So, so the, 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 cycles, the, the, the cycle time is probably in a couple of years. So many of these incubation centers have some degree of linkage with VCs. And also in China, we are beginning to see a lack of quality deals, also in China. In fact, every time we go to China, the, the investor says, uh, bring, bring us some of your Hong Kong deals. <laughs> we are looking for good deals and we are running out of them in China. So even in a place called, as large as China, we are, we are seeing a, a degradation of, of the quality of the deals. For example, what we are seeing, particularly in the last year, more and more UG students stepping up to the plate, commercializing their professor's IP. Uh, they don't really necessarily have the full credential to commercialize the IP. They'll stand up there and they'll, they'll thumb their chest and say the professor's behind it, but the professor's at the same time behind 10 companies because the professor has a huge IP. So they back 10, 10 companies, and so all 10 companies claim that this same professor is part of the team, which is not possible. <laughs> so it's gotten to the point now where these companies step up to the plate and within five minutes, the, the investors stop them. They said, stop. You, you, you're not qualified to do this. You, you know, I don't care if your professor says he's behind it. He's not. Move on. So, so this is beginning to happen. So, so the pipeline is running thin, even in China, for, for a country that size. Uh, there's also what we are seeing is increasing amount of policy coordination. It's really amazing how, how they do this so quickly. Multiple government levels, some degree, there's some degree of destination of strategic regions. Uh, for example, Ch Shanghai in Shenzhen, Nanhai in, in Foshan, uh, these are designated to be strategic regions in those provinces. I have, I have seen, well, pro confidentially, they have passed me these documents from the central office with this stamp saying that henceforth, Shanghai is now identified as a strategic region for this. Resources, policies will then be adopted thereon. So the coordination goes from, this, from the country level all the way down to even the municipal level. And here we're talking about policies, not just resources. 
uh, they also have coordination at the value chain level. Believe it or not, they're actually creating their own value chain out of nowhere. And they're pulling in the top players, the middle player, and the small player, and they're putting it all together into what they call the consortium. And so all of a sudden, out of nowhere, a value chain comes up. Uh, and we are seeing this, for example, uh, Beijing probably of all the cities and, 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 and provinces, I would say that there are less disagreement in terms of Beijing's success in entrepreneurship. Uh, I think, and, I, and I think that by and large, people have accepted that Beijing has been more successful in IT, simply because the value chain is more complete in Beijing. Uh, Tencent is there. Alibaba is there. Um, Shanghai, what we are seeing is that the value chain is beginning to form in fashion. And they are putting a more concerted effort in, to try to pull together a complete value chain in fashion. Uh, in Guangdong, Guangdong is historically the manufacturing center of the world, as we know. Uh, and in my discussion with the government officials, these are three hot topics right now. Uh, if you go into Guangdong, if you offer precision manufacturing technology, if you offer all robotics, you offer autom automation, and you have some kind of technology, they'll probably fund you. And so they, they, this is now. Th this kind of coordination starts at the country level. It goes all the way down. Now Guangdong is, is putting their pro first priority on stimulating uh, these areas. And believe it or not, even at the bullet train level, there is now policy coordination. Uh, they, they, they have, or I'm not saying anything that will get me in trouble. They have already released information on the bullet train path uh, in construction for the next five, 10 years. That's publicly available. Uh, they are building the value chain along that bullet train. So they are already anticipating the migration of their heavy manufacturing along the blue train path from the heavy Guangdong province further up, three hours away. Three, three hours away on a bullet train <laughs> goes a long way. <laughs> There's something like 300 kilometers on a bullet train. Uh, so this is also being planned out and executed. Coordination, we are talking about coordination at the government policy level, at the value chain level, and at the bullet train level. So what is HKUST doing in Hong Kong? Well, in Hong Kong, we are creating a coordination platform. Uh, we, are, we are basically, a, we are willing and proactively seeking other partners in the region who has activities in entrepreneurship, take that information and post it on our website so that, so that our, at least our community member would, ha would have the latest information. And as that builds more and more of the community would come here and there, there would be a central location uh, for coordination, uh, at least increased coordination. So in terms of information posting, uh, we are extending our competition. HKUST run a fairly successful entrepreneurship competition. I'll say fairly successful in the context of university. Uh, this is the fifth year we're running it and we have uh, received, let's just say that our, our competition judging process have been recognized by the, by the professional investment community. So we are extending that competition uh, to include other uh, universities in China and include other universities around the world. So this year, for example, our competition is ex expanded to include international team. We can actually have an international team that has no association with HKUST whatsoever. We, of course, limit the size. So this is by invitation only, so that we don't have 99% international team and 1% local team. We have about 10 teams that comes in by international uh, invitation. We have also launched our pre-entrepreneurship training. This training is basically a uh, material that I put, put together, that I developed based on my 10 years of uh, startup experience, and that this is now two years in the offering. Uh, totally, I think I've offered it probably to about a little bit less than 10,000 people. Uh, and for the pre-startup uh, pre workshop, it consists of basically market positioning and team building. Through the market positioning, they will, they will better understand what it means market, what it means product, what it means technology, technology as a tool to make money, and not as the end to, to the business itself. Uh, we, we give seminars on tech opportunities, uh, and we also give seminars on market opportunities, and this is something that I would like to explore with, uh, with Albert on to see if we can work with IEMS to talk about the market opportunities, to present to our students so that they can better comprehend what is happening around them so that they can potentially develop an idea. Uh, we, we have cultural promotion events. We are constructing our own entrepreneurship launch. The budget for that really exceeded my expectations, so it's supposed to be a pretty good launch, I think. <laughs> um, we have team building events. Obviously, uh, undergraduate student 
they don't necessarily know a business person, an accounting person, a uh, marketing person. So we, we, uh, we hold uh, the, the uh, team building event so that students can find their other teammates. Uh, accounting student, marketing student, finance student can find science student, engineer student, and they, they can form a team. And we also provide uh, more structured mentorship uh, so that uh, ideally we would like to take this in the direction of a clinic hour. Every Friday, 5 o'clock to 7 o'clock, there will be an experienced mentor. Come and see your doctor. <laughs> Uh, we are also releasing the equivalent of a POC fund for UG students. Here, our objective is not to create the next Google, although that would be a good idea. That's not our objective. Our objective is to just create pre-entrepreneurs. So this is more focused on education than anything else. So we sprinkle our money around so that they would have enough to get started. It's very difficult to, to even pretend to do a business when you don't even have any money whatsoever. So we sprinkle some POC fund for the students. We are releasing basically $400,000 Hong Kong to the students. Uh, in China, what are we doing? We work closely with UST's existing bases in China. Uh, we have four bases in China, uh, Shenzhen, Guangzhou, Fushan, and basically in Zhejiang. Uh, so these are the areas that we are basically active in. Uh, and here we expand, for example, our pre-entrepreneurship activity in China, particularly in Guangdong. This is our first expansion. Uh, th th there's a uh, student organization that we call the E-Academy. It's a funny kind of animal. It's run by the student, but it's sort of guided by old timers like ourselves. So we sort of give them overall ideas and the student, based on their passion, they run it. And since our objective is just to stimulate pre-entrepreneurship, we are not really focused on whether or not there's the next Google team. Um, so we, uh, we have run this E-Academy for about two years, and in Guangdong, we're going to set up the, the Guangdong chapter. There's something called the Guangzhou University Maker City. Those of you who don't know it, you may want to pay attention. That city alone has a student population of 200,000. It's 20 times the size of HKUST. Student population for this university is 200,000. This is a very ripe place for us to roll out the E Academy Guangdong chapter so that very quickly we have more students interacting and the objective is to create a ritual pool of pre-entrepreneurs. It's, no, 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 no. This is that one university. Oh, really? <laughs> can, you, can you name it? I think it's called Guangzhou University Maker City. They have an island. This only university has 200,000. Yeah, 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 yeah. They have their own island. I'm serious. They have their own. It's, it's an actual island. It's four sides has water. And, the, and, and, and that university is on the island. It's actually not one university. It's, it's actually a network of five or six universities. Together, they call it the Mega City University. It's got 200,000 students. Well, if you add staff and everybody and the police, I would say probably 300,000, 400,000 people on an island. You don't want them to escape or? <laughs> <laughs> I, I think the island was basically uh, chosen to develop because the, the land was the most, the most abundant. So what we, are, what we are seeking to do with this E-Academy is basically increase the student's network and horizon. Again, the focus is to create pre-entrepreneurs. That's it. Not necessarily entrepreneurs, just create pre-entrepreneurs. These will be seeds that will help others. Uh, ex we are expanding our competition, as I mentioned. For example, Shanghai Indochina competition. This is a competition that's run by Shanghai that we co-run, we co-organize, that we help them manage. And we run the local competition in Hong Kong and then in, Chi in Shanghai is the main competition. The, the funny thing about this competition is that there's no winner. You pass the finalist test and the final point is, is that an investment or not? There, there, it's not academic exercise where I deem you to be worthy, so therefore I give you an A. There's no such thing. You pass the limits test, you're deemed you deem qualified, that's it. Then investors come and say, okay, I make an investment. So it's more an investment competition than, a, than an actual entrepreneurship competition. Another one that we're running, I for, I, I forgive me for the Chinese writing, uh, but I understand that some of, the, some of Russian friends may actually read Chinese. Certainly some of our Chinese friends can speak Russian. Uh, this is a, a, a competition that runs in Guangzhou. It is a competition positioned to tap the two shores and the four places. <laughs> Basically, Macau, Hong Kong, China, and Taiwan. Thank you. 
So it, it's, it's the, the, the main objective is to stimulate interaction among these four places. And so we are the co-organizer for this, and we play a key role in driving that competition. Now, of course, our million dollar competition this year, we're going to have a expand our uh, competition to include Nansha in, in China. We're going to have a major exhibition in Nansha, and all of our semifinal team will have a presentation at the exhibition, and investors will be invited. So you will, you will slowly morph into an investment event than an academic judging of ABC. So this is happening this year, and you happen in Nansha. What else are we doing in China? We, we work closely with those spaces. We offer our training program. I, I talked about the pre-entrepreneurship training program. There's also an entrepreneurship <coughs> training program that we offer on four things, marketing strategy, sales strategy, financing strategy, and teaming strategy. Those are four areas, totally adding up to 32 hours of training, uh, eight days, no, four days, eight hours each, four days. So through this, we bring in vital partners into, into HKUST. We are, through this activity, we are bringing in VCs, PEs, corporate, uh, corporate sponsors, Siemens, Legend, um, the big names. They are very much interested through our training program to work with us. And so they are, they are coming in. Uh, some of the private companies, the SMEs, they are looking to stimulate uh, uh, the next innovation in toy, the next innovation in LED. So they will be sponsoring an award in that area. Toy award, LED award. Through that, it's a win-win. Our student has an additional direction to push, and then they also have the opportunity to stimulate something that they will be interested in investing in. We also work with some of the governments in China, uh, uh, also incubation and funding some of our team that we think are, are worthwhile. We can easily refer them to, to China, and they will get funding and space. Uh, this also helped to increase the access for our UST entrepreneurs uh, beyond Hong Kong. Hong Kong is a fairly small place. China, by definition, is much larger. We would like to encourage them to look beyond Hong Kong. Uh, so, in, uh, for example, I'll just talk about 2014. We had one, I, I talked about one team that did not make it into uh, in any of the winning places, but we helped them secure 2 million uh, RMB funding in Shanghai, just simply because the, the funding opportunity is just so much, so much larger in China. So that's it. I hope this seminar helped. Thank you very much. Thank you. We have some time for some. I have a question on your training camp. Sure. I checked. Actually, Skokofo sent, sent six students over in July to attend our training camp. Uh, Misha? Mi Misha? Yeah. Uh, yeah. So this is a school yeah. place for science technology, I mean. Yeah. It's yeah. Cool. yeah. Oh. Sister no, I think. No, Misha. 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 Ah, Misha. Uh, Misha. Okay. Okay. Top Academy, yeah. uh, can you just briefly, I checked some information on your website. Can you briefly describe it? I mean, there are a lot of people, hundreds of students, <coughs> a weekly, a week uh, course. Is it paid? Uh, what is the outcome? Uh, that, that course we offer in, in different places, in different contexts. In, in the university, we offer it to our students, obviously, it's for free. In the outside, for example, in China, we offer the courses. Uh, it's generally a four days workshop. Uh, we limit the, 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 the attendee to uh, under 50. Mm -hmm. And each, for a four day workshop, each pay about 10,000 RMB. So, so for about 30 of them, it's about 300,000 RMB for four days. Uh, and generally, the objective of, the, of that workshop, and that goes to university, it doesn't come to me, don't worry. <laughs> okay. uh, so the objective of that, of that workshop is to uh, help the entrepreneur, uh, particularly those in, in China, uh, get started. They, they can't, they, they're having problems getting funding. They, have, they were invested because they were promising technology. Uh, the Chinese system has developed to the point where they are, re they are able to ably recognize whether or not the technological content is there. So they make the investment based on that. But technology is a tool. They are not able to move forward. So that, that's a huge group trap there. And so we give them a four-day workshop to, number one, translate the technology into a meaningful value proposition, translate the value proposition into meaningful market positioning, aligned with the core components, translating that into meaningful sales strategy, identifying who the first adopter is, pricing strategy, second adopter set, how to make the transition, 
translating that into how to do financing through series A, B, C, D, how to price it, what tools you use to, to bridge the gap between yourself and investors, and then finally, boiling that down to a meaningful execution plan in terms of for the next three, three years, what, what should be your meaningful milestone so that you have meaningful exits uh, at any point in time. So that entire thing wraps up in four days, it's 32 hours. Okay, and once again, what's the price here? The, for, for the prices that we offer to, to external people that are not related to HKUST or is 10,000 RMB per person. I had, I had a question about technology because it seems like a lot of uh, entrepreneurship is really coming from the universities. It's all very closely connected to yeah. uh, technology. And even in the Russian case, we saw a lot of the, even the big entrepreneurs have some root in engineering. Right. All this activity in the Pearl River Delta, all these competitions, all these incubators, it just seems like given that the quality of the kind of university level training in science is so, it's probably much below, let's say, UST, that maybe there's all this activity, but there's very, there's much fewer really good technologies to back up those things. So. Is that, a, is that a main constraint for them? My, my, On our side, we maybe have the technology, but we have somehow less of the willingness for the you know, macro reasons you gave for people to... I think, I think what, you, what you said is, is, is not wrong. I, I, will not, I will not perceive that as, to, as the major, th major limiting factor. What you, what you said can be a major limiting factor. Certainly, uh, and, and this is, I, I say this with all subjectivity, I'm a UST staff and former faculty, so obviously our, our technology is the best in the world. So, so having said that, uh, relatively speaking, I think the, the students in China, percentage-wise, they will have higher technology at the same level. That's correct. But that's only at a percentage level. When you multiply that percentage by a student population of 200,000, in absolute number, you will have many more than HQUST. So I do not perceive that as, a, as yet the limiting factor. The more limiting factor is the entire investment pipeline. Companies coming in, are they going out? If they're not going out, then the money's going to stop because someone's going to ask hard question about where's the money going. And that question is actually beginning to be asked. And I think it's directly and indirectly related to see with the crackdown on corruption. I'm not implying that this is corruption, but corruption means that if corruption implies the, the, the need to look at things macro microscopically, then, then they're certainly looking at this microscopically. And they're, what they're seeing is that all this money is going in. Where's the company going? And so there's now creating more and more of a pressure to help these companies move on. So uh, it's, not a, it's not a problem with the quality of these. It is, a, it, is a, it is a problem. It the be, I mean, you could imagine this. Uh, the government has all this money it's throwing around. It <laughs> likes the idea. Of, so it's throwing around. So you're going to get a lot of people you know, incubating and whatnot. But they stop at this stage because that's a stage when you really need much bigger funding right, to, to yeah. move beyond that bottleneck. Yeah. And so you need real corporate interest. So maybe the fact that you see few exits is just a reflection that they're generating a lot of useless activity. That, that, no good, there's very few good ideas. So that, that, stops, not that may be the case. I, I, I could perhaps share with you, I have visited in, in, the, in the Pearl River Delta maybe about 300 incubati, incubation sites. Uh, and of the 300 incubation sites, I have seen just a five-minute hello, of course, obviously. But uh, I have seen some, a good number of them that are, uh, that are fairly promising. Uh, but they're not able to move forward just simply because they, they have chosen the wrong product. They have chosen the wrong marketing direction. Uh, even the best technology in the world, you, you can choose the wrong direction. Uh, and they, they are not yet finally attuned to market positioning. Uh, they, they're still very much in the mindset that if this is tech, uh, a great technology, it will sell. Well, technology doesn't sell. So we are seeing more of that than what you said. Now, as this problem gets solved, then what you said will start to come up, of course. That will be the next bumper. But the first bumper is not yet there. The first bumper is that I'm actually still seeing a, lo a large number. I would, I would estimate this. At any given moment in time, if I walk into, into an incubation center in China, at least in the Guangdong area, I would say that probably 25% of them that are stuck could easily be unstuck. 25%. Yes, sir. So you talked about how Beijing is an IT center, Shanghai fashion, and 
I didn't say that they're IT center. I said that they're making more progress than IT. <laughs> the other the other center is going to hate me if, if if I actually said that. Well, okay. Um, remember when I first started, uh, my, first, my first disclaimer is that China is too, too large for anybody to talk about in any kind of definitive sense. In the, in the spirit that this, we are in academia, I will share with you my personal perspective. Uh, but I could, be totally, I could be totally off, okay? Uh, and first, I, since I'm being <laughs> recorded, I will, I will just say that I'm not sure if I agree that China is not a free market, okay? It depends how we define a free market. But to answer your question the other way is that from, my, from, what, from what I have seen, I'm talking about documents and the people I've talked to in the, in the government offices, what I'm basically seeing is a picture where they are defining some of the key strategic city as a pilot test. And then based on a the pilot test, then they will roll out across the board. So Shanghai is a pilot test. You know, we know that Shanghai is establishing a new free port or free economic zone or something like that. Shenzhen is another one. Guangdong is another one. Okay, Beijing, I don't think they, they, they see Beijing as something that needs a test because IT infrastructure there is much more developed. So Shanghai, uh, uh, Shenzhen, Guangdong, Guangzhou, these are all areas that are being pilot tested in different aspects. As these become successful, you will then roll out to the second tier and third tier. Also, remember the, the, the bullet train scenario. The, as the bullet train becomes more, more developed, there's going to be a migration of industries from the coastal city upward, right? But the bullet train is just going to people, not materials, right? So I'm, not sure if the, I'm not sure the degree that the bullet train pertains to, 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 <coughs> to uh, material, but I will say that if we look at innovative co company as a network that requires the movement of people, uh, then the bullet train is something that they believe they want to build into their into their plan. Whether or not it is your work or not, I, I'm not I, I, I cannot say. All I'm saying is that if you ask me to take a guess, I will say that the first priority right now is in the first tier city, both in terms of the economic importance and GDP contribution and in terms of the value in term, uh, uh, of, of, of pilot testing a model. This is very important to the Chinese government to make sure that there's a model that's worthwhile to roll out. Otherwise, they roll out across the country and the whole thing collapse. Chengdu? Doing that, Chengdu, the city, uh, yes, they are actually doing that. Okay. Like start a strip there and uh, let young people do some entrepreneurship in IT. Yeah. So I think it, it is happening. Yeah, actually, the, then uh, 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 let me, let me p p perhaps find two more, I said a little bit. Remember, I said about the, the, uh, the countrywide competition. The, there's a countrywide competition that occur, occurs across China. This is, this is equivalent, I was, I'm not sure, sure if that's equivalent in America, but certainly for high school students, that's equivalent to Westinghouse competition. I'm not sure if that's equivalent for the entrepreneurship. So this occurs across all of China in all the provinces, uh, stretching through from, the, from, the, from, from that side to, to, to the northeast all the way over. So entrepreneurship is being cultivated, it's being encouraged, but whether or not it's encouraged to the same degree as the first tier city that's a separate question. And first, first this city, they put more emphasis because there's a value to, 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 uh, to both to the GDP and as well as to, to fine tune what is an appropriate rollout model. That's what I meant to say. But yes, thank you. The, the entrepreneurship is, 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 is largely encouraged all over China. I think we're at the ending time for thank the you. session. So I want to thank uh, Stephen and